morning. I'm Rosalie Schaefer, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I welcome you to our program today. Today we're going to be talking about a very important subject, the future growth of Manatee County, and how should we plan for it? What will Manatee County look like in 20 or 30 years? Now is the time to plan for the future and guide the plans that will shape our county addressing issues such as the prevention of sprawl, traffic uh, control, protecting our natural resources and farmlands, creating walkable communities and vibrant communities. We are pleased to have with us Manatee County's planning official, John Osborne. He's been working on this subject for a number of years now and he's going to present us the current options and lead the discussion. After his presentation, we will have questions from the audience. At that point, please use the microphone over in the audience area. State your name and your question. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, hear about the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. Thanks for having me here today. How we grow is an important question to ask. It's an important question to ask our, our, our citizens. In the past 10 years, we've been going through a lot of changes in the county. We saw great years of, of boom and development, but we also saw a lot of changes also to coming demographically and changes in the sense of who's coming to, who's coming to Florida, but also what are their expectations and who's coming in the future? Who will be the ones buying the houses that we're building today? Who's that next generation or the echo boomers or the generation Y? We're also looking at the way we've done things in the past in the sense of the land development regulations that we operate under today, the policies our county commission makes decisions based upon. Is there a better way to do business? Is there a more efficient way that helps better capture what the market trends are today, but also what they're gonna be in the future? No matter what, in Manatee County, we're going to be growing. And right now, we have about 326,000 people in Manatee County, including the cities. But you can see these population projections will be growing quite a bit by 2035. And that's sort of the time frame of this, this study, of this report that, that I've been working on. So 2035 is sort of our, our, our end time frame. But we're looking at approximately 450,000 people being here by 2035. Now these population projections we utilize are from the University of Florida, Bureau of Economic and Business Research. Now for this study, we actually ramped them up quite a bit. We assume more of a, of a depends on your, what glasses you're wearing, a best case scenario or a worst case scenario, depending on your vision of growth or your perception of growth. But we actually, we needed to do that when we do long term infrastructure planning, we need to plan for more of an intense scenario. And we do that to test the infrastructure test the water system, the sewer systems, 911, public safety, all the things that we provide services for, the library, so we can also can give ourselves more ample notice when we do have to start looking at doing improvements to various infrastructure and services, because it takes a long time to fund a lot of these things. Did to give you an example, for us to uh, or work with the state to widen a roadway, typically that's like a 10-year process. By the time we actually see the need for it, get the funding for it, design it, buy the land that we need to buy for and then go build it about 10 years sometimes goes by so it's a long time actually for us to fund it and also to do the expense of these type of infrastructure improvements the larger scale the, the plant level scale improvements though the large roadway expansions we need we need time actually to do this type of work but right now in manatee county this is the development pattern that we see happening most of the developing areas of the county where you go to parish you go to lakewood ranch north county this is the typical development pattern. Now, however, we, we regulate this in Manatee County by zoning and what's called a future land use category on our future land use map. So we put density limitations in through most parts of the developing county, and we limit it to three dwelling units per acre. Now, during the boom years, our Board of County Commissioners actually limited it even further. They have limited it to one dwelling unit per acre, two dwelling units per acre, or somewhere in between. And this was due a lot of times to citizen opposition. Oh my gosh, there's cows there now, and you're gonna put a single family subdivision, reduce the density, please, and they would do that. However, when you start looking at the provision of services 
in the provision of water lines and sewer lines and 911 and EMS and fire department and sheriff's deputies and all the other services, is low density really the answer? There's a lot of impacts to it. This is a simplified version of that future land use map I mentioned to you. And the big area in the green on the east is, is agricultural slash rural. So the, the, there's not a lot of property entitlements on in that side of the world. In other words, it's all tomato farming and other things going on out there. And we don't plan to extend our water or sewer lines, generally speaking, in that big green area. But on the west side of that sort of that line, and really that line, if you can imagine where Lake Manatee is and the dam at Lake Manatee, and kind of draw a line right through the middle of the county, that's pretty much where the end of the world is for water and sewer. That's like that's our future development area boundary. We sort of have a end of the world line out there, so to speak, for, for sewer and water services. But everything west of that line is basically planned to develop. It's planned to have, we, we designed our sewer plants and our water treatment facilities with capacity to serve that area to, for development. So it's, it's quite a large area. We also can ask, ask yourself the question too, you know, where people live versus where people work. There's a lot of different planning that needs to be done in these developing areas to, to provide more variety of land uses. The residential feature land use category that's out in most of that area right now, for example, if you took your hand and covered Lakewood Ranch and swung it up to the port, all that area has a future land use category called urban fringe, and it has a maximum of three dwelling units to the acre. So it's pretty low density. And the land use itself, that designation, pr limits pretty much what you can do. It really limits you to having a single family subdivision and like a Publix at every corner. Not a lot of opportunities for jobs and other things. But when you start thinking about what we're facing now, anytime you read the newspaper or any periodicals, I see a lot of articles nowadays about baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, and the, the children of the, of the baby boomers called the echo boomers. There's all these little different classifications that the, the media puts on different groups of people and by their age and by demographics. And we're starting to see this actually mean a lot of different things when it comes to building markets and what products builders want to start building. We're also seeing impacts to how the county provides services. For example, how libraries operate, how other parks, what recreation opportunities we provide in parks. The coming generations have very different needs, wants, and desires we're finding than the generations that are sort of here today and sort of paying the bills. We're also seeing trends towards smaller housing. And our land development code is pretty generic to the 1980s. We pretty much look for low density residential subdivisions to be built throughout most of Manatee County. But the market's really changing on that. The echo boomers are, are people basically 17 to 31 years old. And these people are coming of age and starting to actually buy houses and look for housing and things like that. They're coming out of college looking for jobs. And in <clears throat> last year in 2012, there were over 300,000 apartment buildings under construction in the United States, more so than any time in our nation's history, from what I'm told. And having said that, this generation, the echo boomers, aren't necessarily looking for perhaps a large single family detached house on a golf course community. They might not, they may, might be looking for more of an urban situation. That's what we're finding. And, we're fi and we know more about these, this generation than any time <clears throat> another previous generation because everybody is so connected for social media, right? But also we're seeing trends with lower house number of households and lower number of children per households but also the, the viability of public transit, more of an urban lifestyle. This is showing up with a lot of different research by this coming generation and what their habits are gonna be like and what their likes and dislikes are gonna be. And that certainly has an impact not only to the housing market and what we provide and allow to be built in Manatee County, but also to the services that we provide as a local government. <clears throat> Our economic development teams, which we have through the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Council, we actually have teams that meet with, <clears throat> excuse me, the widget makers of the world. When they come here looking to relocate their business to Manatee County, or they're shopping for a community to move their business to, we will meet with them and talk to them and figure out what they're looking for. But a lot of these industries that we actually provide incentives to, the biotech industries, the computer programming types, the companies that make a lot of applications for Apple products, and a lot of industries that are involved in the medical world, medical fields, a lot of research and technology, these type of industries, they have a certain employee type, 
employee type that is actually, we know of today as more of a Mac person, Macintosh computers, than a PC person, IBM computers. This sounds kind of crazy, I know. But we know so much about the people and their education and what their lifestyle choices are from all the data that's constantly gathered through social media that we know what they're looking for as a business, what their employees, where they would like to locate, what type of lifestyle they'd like to have, where they would like to live, and the type of housing products they want to buy. And right now, we're not as competitive in that world in recruiting those type of businesses to Manatee County than perhaps other places. When we talk about long-term growth, it's also an important concept when we, when we talk about density. As I mentioned on that map before, that area from Lakewood Ranch up to the port, that area is pretty much designated for a future lower density area. And our county commission during the boom years would pretty much you know, hammer the developers down, low density, low density, low rise. That was sort of the mantra for years. And developers would get beat up at the county commission every, you know, one, one Thursday a month and to get come out with, they, they came in with asking for two dwelling units per acre and they came out with 1.3. But we look at, our, when we ask ourselves the question of this, so let, me, let me explain this a little bit. Every time we, we build a road in Manatee County, whether it's built by the county or by, and most of them are built by the development community, when a development community builds a public road, there's a certain amount of assets with it, a water line, sewer line, every so often there'll be a traffic signalization system. All this is built by the developer and dedicated, given to us, the public, the county, it's built to our standards and specifications. So we are actually, then we start maintaining this infrastructure. So after, once we start maintaining it, then we see to look at, well, what's built along the roadway to pay the bills? Is it dense, anything density or is it 1.3 dwelling units per acre? Well, how many customers do you have per linear foot on 1.3 dwelling units per acre? Is that enough to pay the bills? That's probably the wrong answer. There's also other supporting infrastructure that we have to pay for, and you, and you think of per linear foot. Law enforcement, fire protection, the school buses. How much more are they adding to the roadway network because they have to drive so much farther? How many more lane miles does it take to support a low density subdivision versus something in town here? A lot more. So with this report, and there's a report that's available online it's at mymanatee.org, and this is, there's a summary of all this, what I'm presenting to you today, and you can download it. I'd be happy if anybody wants to give me their address, I'd be happy to mail you a copy. I apologize, I didn't have a lot to bring at the last presentation, I, I gave out my last copies. Uh, but there's three different growth alternatives that we're going to be asking the Board of County Commissioners to consider. The first alternative is stay the course. And staying the course is really, like we said before, this is kind of what you get with staying the course. This is a suburban growth plan, very low density. And think about you know, how many customers have, you have per linear foot. And you ask yourself these questions. Well, we're in this picture. This is sort of a standard subdivision that gets approved in Parish or Lakewood Ranch or wherever. And those are nice places to live. I'm not knocking the places. But you know, where's the school? Where's the doctor's office? Where's the gas station? Where are those, where are those places that you go on a daily basis sometimes for services? Well, a lot of times they're very far away. So you need many more lane miles per household to basically to help support a subdivision like that. And also when you have subdivisions that end in cul-de-sacs, you don't get a lot of use out of the roadway, the, that public roadway network versus something like where we're at today where roads connect and actually go places. This is kind of what you get with growth today. With subdivisions, you get the typical little three, two house with the public sit every corner on a golf course, and that's kind of typical what you see built in Parish and Lakewood Ranch. Now, another growth alternative we studied is a southwest focus, and that's basically the southwest part of Manatee County. And I showed you those population projections of 2035. And what we did was we took 60% of that future population, and we said, what have happened if 60% of the population that's coming by 2035 Instead of just going willy-nilly over the county, that we basically made special incentives and special allowances for that to basically those people to come to the southwest part of Manatee County. What would that do to our infrastructure? What would that do to our water systems, our sewer systems, and things like that? So that's the area we're talking about, the southwest county. And the southwest county is different than any other place in Manatee County. And what happens is it was built very smartly. It was built with like a grid or like a waffle, let's say. Whereas you have the roadways that are built in a very grid pattern. The underground infrastructure, <clears throat> excuse me, is also in a grid pattern. So you have a lot of redundancies. You have, you have, if you have an accident in this part of town, well, there's still a hundred different ways to get home. If you have an accident in Parish or out in Lakewood Ranch and it closes the intersection for a length of time, you could take, you have to drive around the moon to get home because there's not, nothing ever really connects. 
But also you'll notice too, a lot of places in town even, we still have cows. It's not a bad problem to have, right? But if you look at things like an accountant looks at things, our infrastructure as a community is our assets. And as an accountant, you're always looking to maximize your assets or the efficiency and use of your assets. When you have cows in town, and you have roads that are six lane divided, and you have all your intersections with signalization, you have water capacity, you have sewer capacity, you have schools that you could have more kids in, you already have cops on the road, you already got firemen, but yet you still have cows here. And yet you're building new stuff where you don't have any of what I mentioned before yet. There's no schools, no, fire, no cops on patrol regularly or as much, not as many firemen. So we're building more and more in places where we don't have infrastructure, but a lot of times we have infrastructure availability in town. But a lot of times our own development rules prohibited this from happening or this from developing. So we got in our own way. Before I, 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 um, came, I came back to the county, I worked in the private sector for several years. And I worked all over the southeast working for land developers. And one of the things that got in our way a lot of times with projects like this is traffic concurrency. And when I'm talking about traffic concurrency, what that means is when we go to say propose a project in an area like this that's in town we have the same standards in Manatee County for roadway congestion here as we do like in Parrish. What happens is is that you basically leave parcels like this behind and underdeveloped because a developer who's building 100 houses can't afford to widen US 301, can't afford to widen University Parkway. They can certainly contribute towards it, but a lot of times what's called concurrency rules get in the way of redevelopment. And part of the problem is along there's many of these areas, we have, we have some blight in some areas in the 41 corridor. And these areas are continuing to go down in value. But one of the things that we're all also doing as a county, we are also increasing investments in these areas. And that's due to the water and sewer system being very old. This, a lot of the infrastructure in these areas was put in for the World War II retirees. When they came and settled here, when Bayshore Gardens was built, when those places were built, and this area, these areas were brand new. And when air conditioning got cheap and inexpensive, but that, those areas now are 50, 60 years old, and we're having to go in and rebuild the underground infrastructure. And that is very expensive to do. So we're putting a lot more money and reinvestments into these areas. We're spending more money as taxpayers, but the values are doing this. So we need to put more emphasis on these areas, getting them cleaned up, getting more available for development and redevelopment to help get a return on our investment, but also not to leave behind these areas until we get, we, and private investment typically follows public investment or reinvestment in these areas. So this is a, certainly an, an opportunity in these areas to do different things. And this is something that the development community is really looking at. It's their opportunities to also have mixed land uses. Instead of having your single family detached neighborhood behind the gated community, more urban type development, this is something that the coming generations are more or less looking for. We see it time and time again showing up in periodicals and other National Association of Realtors is doing a, a really a proactive outreach right now to the real estate community through a publication called On Common Ground. And they're really promoting and showing the advantages of this stuff. And for us, you ask ourselves the same questions. You know, how many customers do we have as taxpayers per linear foot with a picture like this? Well, we got a lot. We got a lot of people paying the bills, but it's a very different lifestyle. It's a very different type of way to live. It's a much more of a, more, it's not quite new, it's not nowhere near New York, but it's definitely a little more urban than what we got today. And there's certainly the other development patterns. These are very popular in other, in other metropolitan areas right now. This is actually, um, that's the Publix at Sarasota. And this was a project that was actually um, built in, I think this was Atlanta. On the, it's, it's, a, it's an image, it's not a photograph actually, but it's a project that was proposed in more of a metropolitan area. And we're seeing a lot of these trickle down start to show up um, and being talked about by the development community here. <clears throat> so in Southwest County, we have also a lot of assets. We have the, the schools, University of South Florida, the State College of Florida. We also have great proximity to our airport, which is a major economic in engine for us. <clears throat> so the southwest part of Manatee County has a lot of assets and a lot of capability because of its gridded roadway infrastructure, its gridded utility infrastructure, and the, and the availability of all the things that we've already paid for as a generation that are already there that could also continue to be to added to. But the, the third and final growth alternative that we studied was an activity center growth alternative. 
And what this would do was take already what's going on to the Port Manatee area, the parish community, the US 41 area, generally talking about the colleges as well, and the Lakewood Ranch area. But what we're talking about doing is, again, to looking at 60% of that future population. And what if we could focus them in on certain areas? Because right now, they're kind of just going willy-nilly everywhere west of that big green line. They pretty much extend the utilities and they build what they need to build. They do certainly do offsite improvements and widen roads and things like that. But it's sort of, it's very, you know, helter-skelter. It's all over the place for us. And it's very difficult as a community and very expensive as a local government to serve that type of development pattern on a long-term basis. So we're looking at, well, what if we could basically consolidate them more? Hey, talk to the development community about, you know, if you focus it on this areas, it'll be cheaper for us to serve because we can serve more people per linear foot at a time and also have more certainty for the development community in terms of service provision, but also certainty for the citizens because every time a new subdivision gets built in parish somewhere, we get calls for, well, where's the school coming? Where's the bus coming? Where's the library coming? When's this coming? When's that coming? And it puts a lot of pressure on the county commission to try to appease people when you don't have the budget, the resources to efficiently serve those people in those newer areas. I won't get into all the details about every different little community, but Lakewood Ranch has a, a lot of momentum already. The, the difference between Lakewood Ranch and parishes is in Lakewood Ranch, there is one property owner. Schroeder Manatee Ranch, and they basically develop chunks of the ranch at a time. So we deal with one property owner for getting all the, the utility lines put into place, the water lines put in place, we get the schools, we get all the things we need, and it's a state process called a development of regional impact. And it's a, it's a long-term entitlement process for them, but as a community, we get more we need. The difference being in the parish area, we deal with one developer for one little 100-acre parcel here, then I deal with a different owner with a different 100-acre parcel here, and, you, and you, you can see the inefficiencies of extending one utility lines this way, one this way, road improvements here, but not here. And it's a little bit, it's much more messy dealing with a larger area that doesn't have a master plan to it. <clears throat> now the US 41 State College of Florida area certainly has a lot of advantages in terms of the infrastructure that's already there, but also what, how can we do a better job of focusing redevelopment in that area? Is there any incentives that we can provide? Because there's certainly a lot of opportunities for us to save money by having more people come to this part of town versus maybe some other parts of town we don't have infrastructure yet. And the parish area, like we talked about before, which is up in the US 301 area, and the parish is a pretty large area. Um, it's an area that's been growing, like I said, during the development boom years. But also there's an active civic association in the area who's very concerned about growth. Um, but they've also, they don't have this sort of, the, um, you can see that on the, on the lower right hand side, some of the older communities that, uh, or older houses that existed in Parish that are still there in the village core area. But you also have a lot of areas like on the left hand side, doesn't look like there's any houses there, but they have an overlay district, a zoning overlay there that really makes things stay rural looking. But at the same time, you also think about, well, how many customers do we have per linear foot? How far are they having to drive for everything? Can we build a roadway network in the future in Parish that takes care of those additional needs that they need that are much high, at a higher level for transportation than we currently provide to citizens in the western part of the county? So of course, when Parish develops, we saw these pictures before, that's generally what it looks like. I think I'm gonna go through some of these, but Parish, we're certainly developing from cows and we can either go one of two ways. We certainly can stay cows. I mean, that's certainly an alternative, but it's also an alternative if there's already water lines and sewer lines investment in some areas of parish, maybe we don't want to keep cows in those areas. But right now the development trends are for what's on the top, which is the typical lower density, single family development, but also the parish civic associations done their own research. And on the bottom right there, not that everywhere needs to develop in a more of a higher density mixed use fashion in parish, but they've identified some areas that they'd like to see more of that type of development happen which also helps us out in terms of providing more concentration, more density and things like that. Areas that we have more customers per linear foot that helps us make up for some of the areas above. Now our port area is a major economic engine. We don't have too many ports in this country that still have vacant land around them. We had uh, Maersk, the international shipping conglomerate visit Port Manatee not too long ago. And they were just, standing there with their mouths wide open like oh my gosh we didn't even know this was here and we're the closest port to the panama canal <clears throat> that's port manatee today 
but the port and, a, and the, around it has a, a lot of opportunity for a lot of economic growth. And this is an area that also we need to do a little bit better job providing more infrastructure to in terms of water capacity, sewer capacity, and, and future roadway capacity too as well. But it's for an entirely different reason than for supporting single family housing developments. It's for potentially porting major economic development that also pays a really good salary and a really good wage. Basically sort of reinforcing, you know, a higher level middle class in the county. And we're also seeing a lot more, uh, seeing more and more port traffic in there. We'll see more and more break a bulk type um, shipping out of the port in the future. And there's also a lot of industries that are looking and shopping for port area properties for use of the port as well for port related industries. That's a really exciting thing for the county to have happen. <clears throat> so in, in short, the, the alternative three is the activity center option. And this would propose to concentrate growth into some areas. We'd have to have the land use regulations to back it up, obviously. But also, it certainly provides us more certainty for services to have more growth concentrated like that. We can do a better job of serving communities that are more concentrated. It's much more efficient for the taxpayers. It's certainly more efficient for the infrastructure provision and the building of it. But in summary, we have, the trends are changing. And we're seeing this show up and it gets, it gets talked about every day. And when I go back to my office today, I won't be surprised if I have phone calls on, answer on my answering machine for somebody interested in building multifamily or another hotel in the community there's a lot of us other all, a lot of other industries sort of that have popped up in recent years one specifically is the sports performance industry and we've had the voluntary tennis academy which later became img we all, we've always had the pirates for quite some time but in recent years we've also had the huge um the huge new sport of rowing come to our community when I was in the private sector, I worked for um, a, a small engineering firm, and I got a call one day from my clients to say, hey, can you look at that lake down there? And I've heard that these, these rowers keep bugging me about, you know, that they could, you could row there. What does that mean? And so we did some research for them. It turns out that that old borrow pit, that old mine, was built coincidentally to be very consistent with the Olympic criteria for a rowing facility, which is unheard of. So we took a look at it, provided the feedback, and over time it has grown to what it's growing to today. They're holding their first event uh, this month. Uh, they, uh, actually, a triathlon is the first event at that facility down in um, off University Parkway. And the economic engine generated by that is going to be tremendous. Uh, we're looking at trying to get the 2017 World Championships here. And to an American, that probably doesn't mean that much. And to me, it certainly didn't mean much either. I was visiting my in-laws who live in Terra. And, um, they had some friends from Germany over for dinner one night. And I told them what I was working on, and they just like, they dropped their forks. And you're working on that? That's equivalent of like you working on your Super Bowl. I'm like, wow, I had, I had no idea of the comparison. But this last 17 days is like having 17 Super Bowls in a row. Tremendous economic impacts for hotel, for restaurants, for that area, but also by putting our community on the international map for television as well. So it'll have huge impacts and positive things for our community for generations to come. So really, we're looking at your thoughts on this. We talked about three different growth alternatives. All three of those might be the wrong answer for you. I don't know. You might, you might have a fourth suggestion or tweaking one of these. And we'd love to hear from the league about what, what, what your opinion is on this and what your, what your thoughts are on this, whether it be in person or writing us a letter that we could put in the public comment or could be individual public comment as well. We want to know your thoughts on this. And tomorrow, we're actually having a presentation, one of the first of several on this. And there's the or I mentioned you can download the report that sort of summarizes it gets into more detail actually gets into more detail of all the things I've talked about today. It gets into more detail of all the different infrastructure we've studied. But we also had asked for a second opinion. You know, I'm, I work for the county now. I've been I'm the, I'm the planning official, and this has been my project the past couple of years to look at this and see how we could we do a better job of being more efficient in the future and put together a new growth plan. But it actually ended up being a little bit more of an audit as well. Some of the things that we need to fix that we could do better in the future. But we wanted also a second opinion. We wanted somebody, an opinion of a group that's from the outside, take a look at it. So we hired the Urban Land Institute, which is a, a they're a nonprofit uh, land development research type organization made up of industry professionals from all over. I'm a ULI member as well. And we asked them to take a look at the report, look at our community and come up with some, how can we do things better? Does one of these growth alternatives make sense or does it? Is there a fourth one we're not thinking of? What, what's, what, how do we capitalize on all of our assets in this community? How do we plan for the future generations and what their needs, wants and desires are and be more, be more efficient for our taxpayers? How do we do all that in the future? 
and they're presenting their results uh, tomorrow at 1.30, the Board of County Commissioners meeting. It will be live on television, and it will also be recorded by our, our, our television friends here. And so you'll be able to see a playback of it as well if you can't catch it tomorrow. But it's also, you're welcome to come live in the chamber, provide a public comment, or you can certainly watch it on TV, send us an email or any public comment you'd like to provide on that. But they'll provide their sort of a second opinion of all this and what they think we need to do differently to provide a better and more efficient future for our community. The Board of County Commission, let me back up one slide, will make a final decision late May or early June. We don't have an exact date yet. Basically this, this month and up until that point, I'll be going out to the community. I'm speaking probably like five times a week on this. Um, try to get input, get people informed about the project and try to solicit some input, get people thinking about it. I'm also going to, the, to our youth. We have a youth commission in Manatee County made up of teenagers from the local high schools. We're getting their feedback on it and also from the student bodies of USF and State College of Florida. So reaching out to every community group I can get to, get them thinking about it, get, inform me about the report and try to start having a public conversation about this and help us decide what we need to do in the future to better provide and also to be more respectful to our citizens and making sure the future respects your wishes. So with that, Rosalie, I'll close. I'm available for any questions. Hello, John Osborne. Thank you so much for coming. You did a great job. You know, John, there's always the fear in the county of the high rises and of the community changing to Clearwater St. Pete. I've been here since 1970, and that's always the fear with the people and the visitors. So that's, that's my question. How do you answer that? And also uh, explain about the connector road at the port, near the port. As far as building height goes, in Manatee County, we currently have a 35-foot height limit by our land development code. However, in other parts of the county, it's not 35. It's in industrial areas, it could be up to 70, 80 feet, depending on what type of business operation they're doing. But there's also, you can certainly ask for variants of that as well. But generally speaking, we have this 35-foot height. But also, this study is for unincorporated county. It doesn't cover the beaches. It doesn't cover city of Palmetto. It doesn't cover city of Bradenton. It's for the unincorporated area. And we are looking at all different scenarios did look at building height in the sense of what does the public think about it? Where is it appropriate? You look at in other communities, when you build, you build up instead of out, you have, your infrastructure is a lot more efficient. You have a lot more customers per linear foot. You don't grow out and, and eat up more farmland and green space as quick. But there's also a balance to it. We obviously, we've heard from the public before, we don't want that wall of condos like you see in Pinellas County, and certainly that's not what we're proposing. However, there are, there's also sort of a sweet spot for a lot of the building and development to have not just a three-story building. And sometimes when you get above a five-story building, you start, the architecture changes. You get into pilings, you get to more expensive things. But also, you think about when you drive along the interstate. Is it appropriate to have three, four, or five story hotels along the interstate at the interchanges? Right now, when you go over the interstate overpasses, sometimes you see the roofs of the hotels. I'm not sure that's very appealing either. So that's certainly a conversation we need to have about building height, where is it appropriate? Is it should be a, a limit in places. We had, there was a previous conversation that was called the Manatee County Community Character and Compatibility Study. This was done about five, six years ago. And we did get that input from the citizens. And the input covered ranged from no height here to 10, height, 10 stories here and everywhere in between. But one thing I will say, when you think about redevelopment, when you think about these blighted areas of our community, the Bayshore Garden areas and other areas, that if you built three stories on an area that's blighted today, you might be able to see water. If you allowed four or five stories, you could probably see a lot of water. That is a real estate game changer. It could really change the market and provide an engine, an incentive to redevelop a lot of these blighted areas of our communities. So that's an important thing to think about as well when you talk about height. And in our, we've always had this thing about no height, but also for its properties to be redeveloped for economically, and this is putting my old business hat back on, for properties redeveloped, you need a different, you need a different return on your investment. It's, it's very expensive to redevelop properties and you need to provide density bonuses and maybe some allow some height in certain places. So it's something we gotta talk about as a community to provide some realistic opportunities for the development community to redevelop these areas. 
are, these areas are so big and so problematic for us, it's bigger than any government program to do. And we were just really relying upon the development community to redevelop a lot of these blighted areas. There's only so much as government we can do. Um, th this has a lot of implications for air pollution, for energy, um, for transportation. <clears throat> and uh, the urban infill, infill is more like the European model of, of, for cities where they're um, centrally located and there's more public transportation, there are city plazas, and you don't have as much sprawl. So I was wondering if the Urban Institute is looking at these different models for transportation, for, um, for growth. As far as what they're going to present on Tuesday, I really, I, I don't know. But looking at, at their research that's been done in the past and some of these panel studies that have been done in other places in Florida, that tends to be what they really sort of look at is how are you looking at your infrastructure how are you looking at opportunities for redevelopment? Are you allowing other things to happen consistent with where the market is going today? And younger people are looking for that more of that urban lifestyle that is becoming more and more prevalent in a lot of metropolitan areas. <clears throat> it's my understanding that Lakewood Ranch does not have its own public library. Um, I'm also wondering, the longer I live here, I'm anticipating that my water bill is going to get higher and higher. Maybe I'm wrong on that. And the other comment I had was, how do you go about cleaning up some of these areas that you referred to as blighted areas, like that Wendy's Street? Mm -hmm. um, it seems like an overwhelming uh, task. Mm -hmm. And the, re the redevelopment issues is, is plagues not only our community, but many other communities. But we have to find out what the right recipe is for certainly for development incentives, but also the certain, not to say we relax our regulations when it comes to public health, safety, welfare, but we look at other things that we relax. For example, on the 41 corridor, if it was to redevelop, we have a suburban land development code that doesn't really reflect some of the pictures that I showed you, some of those artist pictures. That would be very difficult in a long and arduous public hearing process with a lot of specific changes to our code that we require allow those things to be built. Not, I'm talking, talking about fire codes and things like that, but just like typical zoning and setbacks and landscaping requirements, a lot of those kind of things. All of our codes are pretty much suburban oriented. We don't have a lot that reflects those kinds of pictures. As far as your, your water bill goes, I, I don't have any idea. I will say this, that we're one of the few counties in Florida that ha has planned for future growth when it comes to water. When we built Lake Manatee and Evers Reservoir, we really planned for the future. And if you heard the story that the commissioners that voted for Lake Manatee, not one of them was reelected because they thought it was the biggest boondoggle in the world, but we probably wouldn't be near the population we are at today if we didn't have Lake Manatee. And we sell water to other communities. So we're actually in a very good position from an infrastructure perspective for our potable water supply, unlike most of our neighbors. The question is, I have a specific question, but it leads to a bigger question. Um, I live in Moat Ranch mm -hmm. and Honoray Avenue uh, goes through there. And just to the north of us, they are building like crazy. And the traffic is getting really bad on Honoré. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there's a plan to put Honoré through, uh, put a bridge and a road, uh, connecting to a road that goes through Tara and goes mm -hmm. to 70. And I know that you said your in-laws live in Tara, but we need that bridge to be put in place so that traffic will alleviate off of Honoré. And it leads to the question of expanding and people not wanting roads in their area. Every road in Manatee County that is not built today or every bridge connection like that with Terra has been in our future thoroughfare map series. It's in our comprehensive plan. And that was adopted in 1989. And we had future and other plans that went back as far as the 1960s for the roadway plans for our county. We're very fortunate that our county has always been planning for the future, not only for water, but also for road, roadways. Now, the, the Terra Bridge specifically isn't, isn't funded to this time, but it's still a line on the map. It's still a, a a project that we work on just like if you've read the paper about 44th Avenue we've been slowly accumulating land and right away for 44th Avenue for decades uh, also for Fort Hamer Bridge and these other projects that are coming to light more lately um, but we are always involved in making sure that we provide and plan for these by getting right of way and things like that when we can get it if you were to for example um, if you lived along let's say 44th or some other roadway 
and you basically put in a business or built a subdivision or whatever it was, we would require along that alignment for you to dedicate a certain amount of right of way. Now we'd pay you for that, but when you came in, now we don't might have pl plans today to build the road, but over time you can see that's how we gather a land and we get, get it at a much better price for our taxpayers by getting it slowly and incrementally over the years than just coming in all at once and trying to buy everybody out and buy houses and other things that jacks up the price a hundredfold when you try to when you don't plan so we, by planning for decades on these projects we get it over get the right of way over time and then we come and actually build when we actually we own the land after many years of you know right of way purchasing at reasonable prices not at fire sale prices so that's how we do roadway planning in Manatee County. I hope I answered your question okay. I think my real focus of my question is what I read in the paper and what I understand is that the people in Tara have been fighting against it, that mm -hmm. the county really wants to go through with it, but they've been fighting against it. And there's more people in Tara than there is in Moat Ranch. So mm -hmm. we're on the losing end so far, but um, I don't know how you can fight against that. And they well, seem to set the money, not set the money aside because Tara keeps lobbying to not put it through. If we were to look at the area today, if we, did it, if we ran it like a traffic model, we have these mathematical computer models for traffic. If we ran it today, would it make, would Tara Bridge make a difference? Surely it would make some difference in the, in the, the distribution network, response times for EMS. It's, it, we definitely have a plan to do it. We don't have it funded for construction right now. Uh, but our Board of County Commissioners, I believe, are going to be talking about again at some point. I'm not sure when they have an exact hearing or a public meeting for it. But, the, yeah, the Terra community is very active, and, and they don't, as long as that line is on the map, they don't like it. But it's also, you know, when you think about as a driver and people that you drive around your community, and it's important for you as a citizen to have these connections, to have these type of, you might not like it if you live right there, but it's important to have for our community for our ems response times to have connections to have roads that actually go places um, it's otherwise it's very expensive and you end up, you'll end up having to widen other roads at a much higher price tag if you don't have some of these connections made my question is um maybe kind of weird but it's something that's uh, concerned me or interested me ever since we moved here about 19 years ago because i've lived in seven other states and it never lived in a town where the county and the city wound in and out of each other. Uh, every other place I've ever lived, it was very differentiated. This is the city and here's the county. Um, could this be a problem? Uh, you didn't mention that there was going to be a problem with the city at all in any kind of uh, uh, you know changes but for instance Bayshore Gardens uh, that may be in the county uh, but it sure seems like the city and and what about Manatee Avenue uh, 59th Street just off Manatee Avenue it's all county I mean I find it very perplexing I, I wonder if anybody else finds it perplexing and the, and the boundaries have been a product of growth and utility extensions over the years. The city has its own water supply and its own water lines and septic or and sewer treatment plant. And it's just them also extending their lines. And during the development boom, most developers, because Manatee County was, we took a, such a long, we, we took a long time in development review during the development boom. And we didn't provide developers a lot of certainty, but the city would. So a lot of times developers, if they were next to the city or close by, they would get, they would get a utility extension from the city with as long as they could annex it. So that's why some of the lines are kind of, it's not a very clean line. So a lot of- We plan to cooperate more in the future. Have you talked about that? We meet, um, and I meet with the, the planning directors of the cities. We meet about quarterly, and we go over what's going on with each other's plans and update each other on different activities, different developments. So we do, we do plan together, um, but certainly they have, they have their own bosses, their own elected officials to respond to, and uh, they have their own direction and orders. But we definitely compare notes and make sure we don't, you know, we look for opportunities also to help each other out, certainly, and to be more efficient, because people that pay city taxes also pay a county tax as well. So we make sure that we're doing our part to keep those, their, their infrastructure and services efficient, the ones that we provide, because we certainly overlap into the cities quite a bit for EMS service and libraries and parks. We also sh we share a lot of things as well that don't necessarily respect the city boundary. So are there retirees coming down here or people looking for jobs, younger families, schools uh, that have to be built? 
Or it's, it's a lot of it has to do with baby boomer retirees, certainly. But we're also seeing too, and we have to ask ourselves a question as a community. And baby boomers, and, and don't take this the wrong way, but baby boomers are sort of like the pig in the python. They're a huge population bubble for demographically for our country. I know I'm talking to a lot of baby boomers here today. I'm a Generation X, or I apologize, but you're, you're certainly this large population bubble. But you got to think about too. Once uh, the, as as your numbers dwindle, who is here to who is here to replace you? Who's here to buy your houses? What what are they looking for for building products? It's very different from what we're seeing in the projections and what we see their needs, wants, and desires are than maybe perhaps what we built or allow or what's here today or what we allow to be built by our land development regulations. So we want to make sure that we also plan for the future and future of your investments as well that we provide opportunity for those to be to continue to improve and react to the market of what people are trying to buy and look for today. But certainly there's a certain number of those um, people that are retirees, young retirees, and there's certainly a certain number too that are young people. There's certainly a certain number that's uh, immigration type population as well to this area. I have one more question, Rosalie Schaefer. I, I was wondering with these four different uh, options, if say the county went with southwest urban infill would that mean that growth around parish and lakewood ranch would be more restricted than it would be if you went with the four growth nodes as far as if we went with southwest county what would likely happen is there are a number of entitlements that already exist during the development boom our county commission improved over 20,000 single family lots up and around the parish area. And those still have entitlements today, so they could actually start turning dirt tomorrow. But there's also between those projects, and sometimes what's built already today, there's cows still. So also we'd be looking at infill development. And infill development certainly means here in town, but it also certainly means in areas of the county, we've already have investments of water lines and sewer lines that are out front of that property today. There are schools nearby that have capacity. So it could certainly mean some areas of parish could continue to be allowed to develop, but we don't want the lines to go further out than we already have entitlements for today. That's what we're trying to limit. Unless they're doing something that provides us a loop interconnect, which provides more redundancy in the system, or there's certain advantages for the county and the taxpayer to provide other give other developments entitlement. But we have enough development already entitled in the county, all those developments out in the parish area, that'll basically meet our growth needs for a number of years. So part of the conversation too is, what do we do about that? What's the, what's the public's thoughts on that? Now those are certainly entitlements are already granted. The state also continues entitlements every year. Every year there's something usually granted by the legislature that extended those development entitlements out. Um, however, if we also proffer up the opportunity to do things in other areas of the county that have maybe advantages in terms of uh, utility hookup fees, impact fee reductions, fewer obligations for off-site improvements. So those projects that are on parish still have a lot of things to do. If they want to turn dirt tomorrow, they might have to widen a road, extend water lines, extend sewer lines, build sewer lift stations. They might have to dedicate a school site. There's a laundry list of things for those developments to do. We're in town, we might not have as much for them to do. They might be able to really build what they want to build and just hook into the existing infrastructure and pay their impact fees. So there might be a, a definite fiscal advantage to basically provide more encouragement for us to allow more development you know, in town, so to speak. I hope I answered your question, Rosalie. Uh, for clarification, do the county commissioners have to decide either or between one, two, or three, or can they take a little bit of one and a little bit of two and some of three? They, they can do whatever they want. Uh, <laughs> We are recommend they, after conversations of this uh, for several years, they basically said, hey, give us, give us some options to choose from. And this is what we did. And they're very distinct and different options. Um, but they could certainly say, hey, I like three, but let's do parts of two, or I like two, but let's do this part of three, or leave it, what, leave it the way it is, or there's a fourth one that they haven't even told me yet. So it could be anything. Uh, 41 business 41 uh, redevelopment corridor I, I was just over there recently and it's like one large parking lot and strip malls would they still continue the strip mall model uh, if they were to redevelop uh, business 41 corridor or would they work more on having uh, pedestrian access via sidewalk and then parking lots behind the structure See, a lot of times a lot of those things that's built even though it's built like that today a lot of our <coughs> excuse me a lot of our rules basically call it for it to be built like that because we have a suburban standard which has puts the setback from the road with a landscape buffer and a parking lot then next then a building that's more of a strip building with setbacks and 
stormwater requirements, and basically you end up having what would normally be an urban area, urban development, looks like something that's out in the middle of nowhere, a little, little you know, commercial, you know, sub, subdivision kind of thing, or a, suburban, or a suburban commercial establishment or a strip center that doesn't necessarily, isn't as walkable, isn't as close to the street. So a lot of times we have to take, our, take the handcuffs off of the development community in some places to say, what's appropriate for you to build here? Build it closer to the street, put, put the parking in the back, or just allow one row parking in the front. Because we also, we have a standard in our county land development code that really over parks everything. If you can go to any pretty much retail shopping center in Manatee County that's been built in the past 10 years, go there on Christmas Eve and pretty much find a parking place. So, and think about those parking spaces that are then there, just sitting there the rest of the year, not even being used. But our parking standards are very high, unfortunately, and that causes also the, the more uh, you know, impervious surface to be bigger, the stormwater ponds are then bigger, and there's less building area then for that site. So it causes a lot of problems for us. It pushes the, this, the uh, building further back from the street, so it's less walkable. It does our, our, we, we get it in our own way a lot with our current land development regulations being so suburban oriented. All fall into unincorporated and any part of this plant it's unincorporated right. uh, and uh, would so that could fall under part three of the uh, options that would fall in the 41 corridor redevelopment plan then and we've had some conversations with uh, the soda mall in the past um, with the current ownership and the previous ownership and basically said what do you need to be successful uh, in the past, our sign regulations uh, prohibited their sign sizes. They also, they didn't maintain a single ownership of the entire mall. Most shopping center developers today own control of the entire mall property. They're owned by several par several different owners. So you don't have consistency in theming and landscaping a lot of times. We basically offered up to them also the ability to do out parcel development. Do you want some restaurants around the outside of it? You know, the things that actually we kind of not say prohibited in the past, but made it difficult to do in the past. We want them to be successful. We, we want to encourage them to and take again. I, I keep using this phrase: take the handcuffs off of them. But that's what we're trying to get them to do. Is you know, what do you want to do? What's your vision for this site to, to help it to make it be successful? And we want that for the, our community. Wants that. And for that area uh, where the mall currently is, and also my my last final understanding is that it's where where the head of Wears Creek is, and with the widening of Wears Creek, that that is where they actually need to have the rainwater go. And since it's all parking lot, that's just an environmentally, it's had a negative impact on the entire community. And anything the mall does, if they add more landscaping and other things to beautify the site, it'll only make it better in that regard by reducing some of that um, asphalt area. We haven't, we, they have, we haven't heard that they want to do any housing or anything like that. That's certainly not, un, that's certainly fine if they want to do things like that, but they all, they're certainly interested in doing the commercial and the retail. Uh, but if they want to provide, certainly be provided the opportunity to do more of a mixed use type of site, that's certainly something that we, we would support as well. And again, it's really helping them be successful. And many times as government and our land development regulations, the attentions were good. But when it comes to sometimes specific sites, we really get in the way and hamper a lot of times redevelopment of, of great and once great sites. And the question was, could the, and make sure if I got this right, Joe, could the county essentially change our sort of suburban land development code? And the, and the answer is yes. However, we don't normally go change things that impact people's zoning categories and things like that without going to the people, uh, without having public hearings and going out and having the conversation. Because it certainly Im impacts people and what they can do with their property. Uh, and also we want to be respectful too. There's a lot of areas of the county that we want preserved and give them incentives to, 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 to continue on. For example, the, the village of Cortez and these great, you know, cultural assets we have and, uh, you know, Whitfield and those, those subdivisions that have been historically been here and successful for decades. How can we help them do a better job and be even better? Um, that's the kind of thing we got to be sensitive about when we start changing, because we certainly want to provide the opportunity to redevelop on that 41 corridor and clean that up. We've got to make sure that we change some of these categories. And again, we always have great intentions, but we don't want to basically also negatively affect somebody as well. And that's a tough balance sometimes. And some people don't like change, but uh, we want to make sure that again, that we provide and maintain those areas that have been on the tax rolls for years that want to stay the same, that want to continually continue to have 
uh, what they've had for years and enjoy that, but also that some of these other areas, some along the major roadways, along the arterials, that we also provide the opportunity for those to be better, to be redeveloped, and uh, to basically have those areas sort of cleaned up by the development community, by more economic development to occur. Uh, but also provide the opportunity in some cases for more housing in some of those areas as well. If that's what the market trend needs to be or is, then certainly, again, take the handcuffs off some of these areas and let the development community come in and, and incentivize them to do these things and clean up these areas. That's what we hope happens. Has there been much discussion in these plans regarding the environment and saving the environment and yes. uh, climate change even? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in the report, we all we, we discuss um, sea level rise a little bit. We're also we're really paying attention to the research that Moat Marine's working on, and that could if 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 predictions continue on, there's certainly an impact to also our engineering, our certainly our stormwater systems, pipe outfalls, pipe elevations. It certainly you know has a substantial impacts, and also we're very sensitive too to coastal hazard planning. Uh, we have density limitations in some of our coastal areas, so we have to balance that too with our redevelopment goals. A lot of the areas, though, I will say in many parts of the 41 corridor are underdeveloped. And when I say underdeveloped, I mean we already have a future land use classification in a lot of those areas that allows up to 16 dwelling units per acre, 9 dwelling units per acre, but they're only developed today at 2 dwelling units per acre. So that even if somebody wanted to come in and increase the density in many of these areas, they could. So we have to do a good job too of making sure that we have redundant infrastructure, that we have evacuation capacity, that we have shelter capacity. So we gotta be really sensitive about how we handle those type of issues. When we looked at the different growth alternatives, uh, certain growth alternatives lend themselves better to uh, lower rates of um, vehicle miles traveled, lower rates of agricultural land consumption, certainly alternatives two and alternatives three are probably more environmentally friendly because they also provide more efficiency of infrastructure, a lot more opportunities for walkability, use of transit. When you have taller buildings and things like that, it's a lot more easy to walk around, get places without a car, as long as you have decent transit, and decent pedestrian opportunities. There's a certain things you have to build to make it happen, but you also have to allow the developers to build it a certain way to, he to help it happen. And right now, our suburban, suburban codes really don't reflect urban development, walkability, and things like that. Not that you can't do it, but it's just not clear or obvious in our code, and it requires a lot of little special approvals to have to, to develop, for the development community to build things in the right way, quite honestly. So we're kind of behind the times that way. Thank you for having me. If you have any official uh, letter response you'd like to provide us please send it to the Board of County Commissioners and again we have tomorrow at 1 30 we're having a discussion by the board on the um, Urban Land Institute's review of this project and uh, in late May or early June we'll have the Board of County Commissioners have a work session and discuss this and hopefully they'll decide and give us some direction on which growth alternative to choose or provide us an alternative growth plan and as staff will get it will receive our orders at that point and put a plan together to, to carry those out which would include potentially changes to our comprehensive plan, our land development code, and a lot of other things that we, we really need to do to update and modernize how we handle growth. But, but thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, we certainly got a lot of information today. Thank you all for your excellent questions as well. And I hope you all will stay active in this issue, you know, uh, comment, write letters, emails, talk to your commissioners, ask more questions. This program is the last hot topic for the year, except that we will have an annual meeting in April, and we're going to have a very interesting guest speaker there, Dr. S uh, Dr. Susan Dellinger. And she's a world-renowned author and owner of her own company on communications. And it's very appropriate for the times we live in because she's going to be talking about how to communicate beyond our differences. And that's very politically um, appropriate at this time given that so many people don't agree with each other. And it uh, will be held on April the 20th at the Bradenton Country Club 
and I've got more information and a registration form at the other desk. And um, I want to thank the Bradenton Women's Club for the use of their hall. And we also want to thank METV for taping this program and replaying it on their station. For the TV schedule to watch it, uh, our program, go on to www.metvweb.com. That's M as in Mary, E T V Web, W E B dot com. Also, see our website for a link to their website. And they also have a YouTube link on their website so you can watch it whenever you want, not just when it appears on their TV station. It will probably take them about a week or so to edit the, uh, the tape and have it uh, put on their station. So um, thank you all for coming, and please consider joining our league and attending more of our programs. Thank you.